grand achievements, meltdowns, funeral crashing, sex for gold. World of Warcraft has seen it all. It's like the Jerry Springer show of MMOs. Luckily for us, much of it has been preserved for our viewing pleasure. There's something oddly intriguing about it. It's like a train wreck that you can't look away from. I'm your magnanimous, melancholy, munificent, myopic, monotonous chronicler, Mad Season Show, and buckle up, because for the next 20 minutes, this is World of Warcraft's most famous and infamous players, part 4. Nerdgasm, a thrill of excitement felt in response to something relating to a subject in which a person has an obsessive interest. I've mentioned before that loot in the World of Warcraft has been made easier to obtain over the years. These days, you can't go a single level without a full new set of equipment, which is convenient, but that thrill of finally getting a new piece of gear is diminished. Back in the day, getting an epic was, well, epic. It was a big event, and you'd spend the rest of your day lovingly staring at those beautiful purple pixels and feeling slightly embarrassed at the noise that you made when you obtained it. Oh, dude, four strength, four stam, leather belt. Ah, uh, level 18. Uh, uh. The voice you just heard was that of Joe. That's it, just Joe. Just another one of the millions of players adventuring in the world of Azeroth. In his leveling, he apparently happened upon a belt. One with force strength and force stam nonetheless, and he uttered the nerdgasm heard around the world. Ah! Uh, uh, uh. Okay. Either that, or he was just having a stroke. What kind of stroke is up for you to decide? And when I say heard around the world, I mean that literally, because unlucky for Joe, someone outside of his group of friends not only was listening, but was also recording. Strength for Stam Leather Belt. Ah! Uh, uh. <laughs> He'd record their reactions and upload them to YouTube for all to see, and Joe was just one of his many victims. For Strength for Stam Leather Belt. Ah! Uh, uh. Joe, is that you and the other one? What? No. Yeah, it is. Oh, dude, four strength, no, four it's strength, not. leather belt. Ah! Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, dude. <laughs> All right, obviously it's not. Oh, dude, four strength, four stam, leather belt. Ah! Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely Joe. Oh, dude, no, it's not. He's been coming in there doing belt. it. Ah! Uh, uh. Ah! Uh, 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 What the hell? It sounds just like Joe. It is. Oh, dude, it is. No, it's not! This nerdgasm spawned a whole series of videos, as the video compiler himself and his fans would replay it to other random people's Ventrilo servers to get a reaction. No, Kaiser Elements. Those are the ones that were on the Deshis, dude. If you get the Deshis, oh, those dude, get four strength, right four stam, leather yeah. belt. Ah! Uh -huh. Holy cow! Ah! Uh -huh. Level 18? Ah! 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 so stupid! Uh -huh. Like I said, the power of pixels was strong. It's like the dark side from Star Wars, except somehow even more nerdy. People have even died over it. It's pretty scary how it can grip people. It's just a game at the end of the day. People take it way too seriously. Uh, <clears throat> never mind that. But I mean, come on, if you're willing to murder someone for in-game loot, what's to stop you from a- Oh no. Well, I guess we may as well get this one out of the way. That's right. Believe it or not, you're looking at a Craigslist ad for a woman offering sex for gold. Let me try to explain just why she's doing this. Back when the Burning Crusade expansion came out, one of the big features being added to the game were flying mounts. You used to be locked to the ground, either on foot or on a ground mount, and the only time you could fly in the game was when you took flight paths, which restricted you to a set path from point A to point B. Now, player-controlled flying was always a highly requested thing, so when it was announced for the Burning Crusade, people flipped out. There was just one problem, though. It costs gold, which is the in-game currency. A lot of gold, in fact. 
too much for most players to have without going out of their way by grinding mobs or professions. Some were a bit more industrious than others, however. Hello, I need 5,000 world of gold for my epic flying mount. In return, you can mount me. You have to have an account on my server, and I want the gold before we do anything. Hmm, upfront delivery. That's pretty smart. You don't want people conveniently forgetting account information post-coitus now, do we? We can quote trade at your place, since I can't host. Edit, because I have a lot of dumb guys message me who clearly don't have the gold. Make sure to send a picture of yourself and a screenshot of your character with the 5,000 gold. You know, that's pretty easy to spoof. Why not have them posing in front of their computer, holding their driver's license, and giving a thumbs up to the camera? I play a level 70 Night Elf Druid and would prefer someone who is into role playing. I have a costume. <laughs> okay, who's paying who now? <laughs> Also, I'm not adverse to the idea of groups slash anal. Now, I know what you're thinking. You, you want to see, see some, some gameplay. Or, er, I mean, there's no way that this worked, right? Come on, this is the internet. You know better by now. Hi, I'd just like to thank all the jackasses that thought it would be funny to post my picture all over the internet and make 50,000 threads about me on the World of Warcraft forums. I got my epic mount in about an hour that was very enjoyable for both parties, while all of you idiots probably spent hundreds of hours farming yours, and you don't even have them. So, talk all the trash you want. I got my epic flying mount, and I got laid, which is more than most of you failures can ever hope for. Ugh, oh, this is all too much. I thought this was a wholesome little channel here. Let's take a break from prostitution for virtual currencies. Let's talk about the Goon Squad. Not really known for being one of the top guilds, but rather one of the top troublemaking guilds. No funeral crashing this time, but some of their work includes cutting Jaina Proudmoore to Orgrimmar to kill unsuspecting city dwellers, forming a raid of zombies during the wrath of the Lich King Lanchiven to infect and kill unsuspecting city dwellers, and tricking Alliance players into attacking an immune player and gathering them up so they can revive all at the same time to kill unsuspecting city dwellers. Well, at least this time, they were of the opposite faction. Their crowning achievement, however, came during the Wrath of the Lich King expansion. The new PvP zone, Wintergrasp, was brand new. One side had to defend a fortress from the other, fending off players, siege tanks, demolishers, and... planes? Well, that's what the box art said, but that never made it in, I guess. The goal of the attacking team was to break through layers of walls using siege tanks, or if you were an engineer, grenades. These also did damage, but since the mainstay of the event was that siege combat, they did relatively little in comparison. However, in preparation for the event to begin, the goon squad perched themselves upon the final door leading to victory of the zone, all having a large supply of grenades. As soon as it started, they parachuted down, and in one minute, destroyed the last gate to win the game in record time. A stunned alliance returned to the keep, only to find out that they'd been locked out and surrounded by elite horde guards, which slaughtered them if they drew too close. Immediately after, Blizzard released a hotfix, which made the grenades pretty much useless in the PvP zone. Hi, this is Gurkhawk from Elitus Jerks. This is a narrated video of Azulamon's speedrun that'll show you how my group has successfully approached the zone. Recognize that voice? That's right. That's the voice of Ian Hazakostis, the current game director of World of Warcraft. This was back during the Burning Crusade, before he was affiliated with Blizzard. He's the leader of the Elitist Jerks Guild, which is one of the most influential guilds in the entire game. In 2008, before the Wrath of the Lich King's launch, he joined Blizzard as a raid and dungeon designer, and seven years later moved up to assistant game director. And finally, in 2016, the game director for World of Warcraft, a position he holds to this day. However, in this video, he's just another player making a neat guide on how to successfully complete the bear run in the Zolaman raid in the Burning Crusade. Our range group spreads out in a semicircle um, around the boss, and the melee obviously are directly on him. You'll see that so far it's taken us 
take us three to four minutes to get here. The time will just tick down to 16 minutes. Or... If you kill the first batch of bosses within a time limit, you were rewarded with a bear mount, and it was quite difficult during the time. So, this guide proved useful to many players, showing different shortcuts and mob skips and boss strategies to speedrun the raid as fast as possible. As someone pointed out in the comments of the video, you can maybe think of this as foreshadowing to the Mythic Plus system, which saw its introduction in Legion. A lot of that came from Diablo 3's Rift system, since they're quite similar, but it's interesting to think that if Ian never became the game director, we wouldn't have had Mythic Plus, which I think is one of the best things that the game has going for it right now. So, think of this as the very first Mythic Plus run in a way. He was also active in vanilla World of Warcraft though. He was the one who did the math and concluded that the Cthulhu fight from vanilla AQ40 to be mathematically impossible to win, assuming the absolutely best geared roster of 40 players making zero mistakes. He was the final boss of the raid. Cthulhu, not Ian, and he went unkillable by even the top raiding guilds at the time for months. Frustrated, these guilds called out Blizzard and accused them of releasing intentionally overtuned content in order to stall for their next raid, which was of course Nexramus. Some were constructive like Ian and they provided the numbers, and others took a slightly more dramatic approach. This is a screen cap of an IRC chat from a member of Death and Taxes another top guild having difficulty killing the overtuned old god. Also present in the chat is Fear, the alias for Alex Afrasiabi, who is the current lead world designer for World of Warcraft. During Vanilla, a quest designer. There's quite a history with him as well, having led the EverQuest guild, the Fires of Heaven, which is considered by many to be the most dominating guild in the entire game. When he was still playing EverQuest in 2003, he made a profanity-laced rant about a new raid called the Plane of Time. It saw a shaky release, so he took to the forums to give the developers an ultimatum. You have 14 days. If after that time the plane is not properly tuned, I am deleting my characters and cancelling all of my accounts. The rest of my guild will follow suit, as well as several other guilds and people that play EverQuest. I did not work my ass off jumping through your idiotic hoops with my friends and guildmates so I could go to a zone where groups of 18 could enjoy the content. Even if past these initial moronic events, I can finally get my entire guild to raid with me. Frig you guys. Seriously, frig you to heck. He was pretty mad to say the least, and the rest of the post was more of the same. So, with the Afrasiabi now employed by Blizzard, in similar fashion with Cthulhu, Z, the leader of Death and Taxes, made a pseudo-parody post using the same nomenclature of Afrasiabi's 2003 EverQuest thread. Instead, this time, giving Blizzard 14 days to properly tune Cthulhu, or he and his guild will quit the game and switch to professional solitaire. Back to the IRC chat though, the guild questioned the professionalism and ethic of Blizzard releasing a seemingly broken encounter, and expressed frustration with their inability to overcome what they perceived as unfair challenges. After carefully pondering their argument that the content may be a bit overtuned, Afrasiabi looked back to the time when he was the player. The frustrated guild leader posed with an unbeatable challenge, and retrospectively, he saw that he and Z weren't all that different. Thus, with great care and deliberation, he sincerely took on the criticism and replied, I think you're just being a retard. Well damn. That's pretty impressive actually. With how filtered everything is these days, to what lengths do you have to go to for an employee of a AAA game to say that you have Down Syndrome? How much would you have to mess with someone to completely send them off the deep end to the point where they publicly lash out at their own community base? Well, the world may never know. It's like a double retardation whammy. I'm surprised you can say that with Blizzard's... Okay, I think you can read the rest of that yourself. The two continued their constructive discussion of old gods and cocks, and it didn't go very far, and incidentally, Cthulhu did end up getting nerfed shortly thereafter, and guilds finally started to beat him. More importantly though, we were left with one of the most dramatic public arguments between a Blizzard employee and members of the community in the company's history. Man, you know what? What am I doing with my life? 
Talking about drama of random people across the world whom I've never met and probably will never meet? On a video that's definitely going to be advertiser and friendly and filled with comments telling me how monotone I am. You know what, YouTube? You have 14 days. 14 days to fix your broken website or I'm going to take my channel and turn it into an erotic audiobook promotion tool. I groan and run my fingernails across his back and he gasps, a strangled moan. Ah, oh, fudge, Anna, he chokes, and it's a half cry, a half groan. It tears at my heart, but also deep inside me, tightening all the muscles below my wit. <laughs> eh, on second thought, I'll just cover the new mobile Diablo game. But first, let's take a glance at an important moment in the game's history. We took the amount of outrage and then doubled it. Jay Wilson is a name that lives in infamy amongst the Diablo community. Diablo 1 and 2 are considered to be masterpieces of the action RPG dungeon crawling genre. You kill demons and you get loot to kill more powerful demons. With just two games to its name, it was one of the most addicting franchises gamers came across with quite the active communities still playing today decades later. Forgive me for giving you all of this backstory, but it's necessary to understand what the feeling was at the time, and just why the fans of the series felt so betrayed. Its creator, David Brevik, is considered to be a god amongst fans of the series, with an outpouring of support even today for a remake to his iconic sequel, Diablo 2. But here comes the year 2012, and with it, Diablo 3. The second in the series released over 10 years prior in the year 2000, with an expansion set in 2001, so there was an immense amount of hype and a thirst for a return to the series. Its existence was announced in 2008, and players for the first time got to see the game in action. This only made the wait worse for players though, because it looked great. The dark demon slaying action fans knew and loved, seeing a return nearly a decade later. But having moved on from Blizzard at this point, it would be the first game in this series without Brevik's personal touch. Blizzard instead left it in the hands of Jay Wilson, a former developer for Relic Entertainment, having done work on games such as The Company of Heroes and Warhammer 40,000 The Dawn of War. Years passed, and work on the game continued. It was teased at the following BlizzCons, slowly revealing each class one by one, and even including playable demos. The game would enter a closed beta stage in the fall of 2011, where a small portion of the first act was playable with all five classes. It looked pretty good, and fans eagerly awaited the release. The day finally came on May 12th, 2012, and the actual launch was a perfect sign of things to come. The game sold incredibly well, shattering many pre-sale records. It accumulated 3.5 million sales within the first 24 hours after release, and over 6.3 million in its first week of launch. As for the gameplay, well, the menus looked good. That was about all the players could say about the game at that point, because no one could log in. Blizzard was unprepared for the massive reception, and their servers couldn't handle the millions trying to log in at launch. There was no offline mode for the game, even for single player. He had to be connected to the internet to play. It would persist even weeks after the game's launch, as archived by this 94 page thread. It was so bad that their offices in South Korea were raided by the Fair Trade Commission because gamers were unable to play their game and they were refusing refunds. Players who did get in however, found a game with potential for greatness, but all in all, a mediocre experience compared to its former release 11 years ago. Players could progress through four acts of story, with four levels of difficulty, and that's Normal, Nightmare, Hell, and Inferno, all providing a tougher challenge, but greater rewards. Much to the dismay of players though, was the existence of the real money auction house system, where they could buy items using in-game gold or real life money. Using the latter option, money would exchange from one player to another, and Blizzard would receive a cut of the sale essentially giving the game a pay-to-win model as players would describe it. A problem made worse with the fact that the higher difficulty settings seemed to be unbalanced and poorly tested. Some classes were able to scrape by and complete it with very expensive gear and a very specific set, 
while others, particularly melee classes, struggled on even the penultimate difficulty, which was hell. The game was tested though, not just by players, but also the team itself of course, and they increased the difficulty of the Inferno mode to where no one was able to complete it, and after that, as Wilson infamously boasted, they had doubled it. Due to this, players pinned the extremely unfair and unbalanced nature of the game on Jay Wilson. Both he and his quotes became the subject of ridicule of players wanting a challenging, but fair endgame. Dying was extremely unforgiving. Drops were few and far between, and the enemies you were fighting gained a random set of affixes, some unkillable to the very limited number of viable character builds in the game. If you died, they would regenerate health, and you'd be left with a hefty repair bill, and with gold also being purchasable with real money, it left a sour taste in people's mouths. It was all too common for people to be in a situation where they had no gold, and all of their gear was broken. The only way to progress would be to start a new character, lower the difficulty and farm low-level enemies to repair your gear once, or visit that ever-alluring real money auction house. Early on, one of the best ways to earn gold would be to run past all of the enemies in the game and just break all of the pots or other destructibles. Behold the brutal non-stop action of Diablo 3. The game saw a record-breaking release, but the active players quickly dwindled once they uncovered its gaping flaws. Critics who originally praised the game began condemning it, and even the series creator, Brevik, was interviewed by Inc. Gamers on his thoughts on the latest game in the trilogy. He gave some criticism on some of the troubles that they were facing, and how he would have done some things differently. I'll have it linked in the description to see for yourself, but all in all, it's pretty innocuous. Members of the development team, however, took offense to the interview, and mistakenly posted their discussion to the public eye, and frankly, were quite scornful. How dare he not lie for us and say that our game is flawless? Where Brevik was professional and courteous, this small group of employees took a liking to mocking him and the past games that he's worked on. This culminated with a comment from the game director himself. Fuck that loser. Oh, this is public? Delete everything. Well, they took the amount of outrage with the game and they doubled it. Due to the problems of balancing and the real money auction house, many fans were already disillusioned with what the game was and how they wanted it to be. Many saw it as a bastardized version of the series that they fell in love with over a decade ago, so to see the person holding the reins of this game post something such as this whipped the fan base up into a frenzy. Some swore off not only the franchise, but also Blizzard as a whole, and only the most zealot-like followers stuck through the whole ordeal. And as a reward for their loyalty, for their undying love of the Diablo franchise, they got to witness an even further bastardized version being produced for mobile devices. What? Don't you guys have phones? Wilson later apologized for his comments, and he addressed some of the problems that the game was facing, and the whole incident goes down as one of the most dramatic moments in gaming history. He would later step down from game director for Diablo and move to the lead game designer for the Legion expansion of World of Warcraft. He parted ways with not only Blizzard, but the gaming industry as a whole in June of 2016. Man, you know what? I'm just not feeling this. There's just something about my crippling addiction to World of Warcraft that I just can't drop. It's such a large world filled with strange, strange people and we wouldn't have it any other way, would we? If you're on the same boat, I'll see you in the next episode of World of Warcraft's Most Famous and Infamous Players.